Hello, you bunch of pieces of and welcome to Knitting Time with Willie. My name is Willie, joined as always by my co-host Nitkulis. And for this video, well, if we're being honest, I'm not really sure how this video is going to turn out. As I continue in my efforts to make my channel less focused and harder for new viewers to latch onto, I started to think about what kind of content it is that I myself like to watch because I figured that's probably something I should try making. After all, if I like it, that probably means that other people will like it too, right? So with that in mind, I decided to take a second to think about what kind of video I would want to click on and make that. So I buckled down and after doing a lot of soul searching, I came up with my perfect answer. Of course, then I realized that I probably wouldn't know how to go about making a video where a parrot and a German shepherd are best friends. So I decided to make one about bad movies instead. One of my absolute favorite types of content is just when people talk about movies that are so crazy terrible that they start to swing around back to being great again. Podcasts like The Flop House and How Did This Get Made and videos by Drew Gooden, Curtis Connor, and, and the other one always consistently make me laugh. And so I think it would be fun to attempt to make my own probably much worse version of something like that. Stuff like that is just fun. It makes you feel like you're hanging out with friends, cracking jokes with one another. And if you can find the right movie to talk about, there's honestly nothing like it. Unfortunately for me though, the key phrase there is, if you can find the right movie. Because when I went into this video, I had not found that, or indeed any movie. Honestly, the only thing I had going into this video was the idea to do a video about a bad movie, which, which now that I'm saying it out loud is less of an idea and more of just a broad thought that I had. And honestly, the more I thought about it, the bigger that if began to feel, because while there are lots and lots of fun, bad movies to talk about, there weren't any that I could think of immediately that, that I myself could talk about. The fact of the matter is that most of the famous good bad movies are famous precisely because some asshole like me has already made content where they made fun of them. And so as far as I'm concerned, those are off limits. Not only do I not want to steal ideas from my peers, but truth be told, if a movie like that has already been talked about, then that kind of defeats the purpose of talking about it anymore. A lot of the fun of stuff like this is discovering new weird corners of the world and being like, what? How the fudge did a person think that they should make this and, and put it out for the world to see? So with that in mind, I realized that I had to do more than just make a video about a bad movie. I had to find a bad movie, you know, something that no one else has talked about yet that I can call my very own despite the fact that it will have, you know, been made by a group of many, many other people who are not, in fact, me. And so, the search began. My first idea for making this video was to go to Amazon and find the worst rated movie there and talk about that, because honestly, that would probably be a much more shareable concept for a video. But unfortunately though, Amazon doesn't seem to want me to see what the worst rated video is. The video section of Amazon is set up very differently from the rest of their products. Like if you can rate their videos on their normal five star scale, they sure as shoot do not show you what those ratings are. Instead, they just have a page set up to show you the movies that they think you might like based on algorithms and stuff, which I guess makes sense in most cases, but for my particular situation right now, it was quite a pain in my cute little butt. Clearly, my initial idea wasn't going to work as I had planned, but I liked the idea of reviewing the worst reviewed movie on Amazon, and I wasn't ready to give up on the concept quite yet, so I did my best to try and cheat my way towards making it work anyway. 
The best way I could think to do this was to just type the word movies into the search bar and see what happens. And by doing this, I was actually able to get to a place where I could sort by rating. Unfortunately though, as I scrolled through the pages, it kind of started to feel like I was losing sight of my original concept. Since I'm guessing that there are probably more than 30 pages worth of videos on Amazon, I wasn't really trusting the results and I didn't feel like I was going to actually accomplish anything in the spirit of what I had set out to do. And honestly, even if I did manage to, I didn't think that I was going to get anywhere particularly interesting doing it this way. And so with that in mind, I decided to come up with a new plan of attack. As I regrouped, I did my best to think of examples of the sort of movie I was looking for. And one of the things that popped into my mind was those extremely cheap looking Pixar knockoffs that you see in the grocery store sometimes that that only seem to exist to attract crying kids who, who are shopping with their parents. Th those seem to me to be underseen enough that I'd probably have a better chance at being the only person to talk about them. And above all else, they seemed terrible. So I did my best to, to try and find myself one of those. So I went to ralphs.com to see what their selection was like, but unfortunately it wasn't as expansive as Amazon's for some reason. I don't know who's doing this, but you can actually purchase DVDs on the grocery store's website, but it's only a small selection of recent movies that probably wouldn't be very good for the purposes of this video. T Truth be told, I've only heard good things about Raya and the Last Dragon. What I needed to find was a place that combined grocery store quality with Amazon quantity, and when I said it like that, I realized that my answer was obvious. So I went to redbox.com and was surprised to learn that it's apparently a robust streaming service full of movies that are cheap and obscure enough that, that redbox.com could afford to host them. Uh, I, I decided to go to the family section because I thought that's where the shittiest movies would be and once I got there I just decided to keep scrolling and scrolling until I got to the dregs so low that even redbox.com didn't feel like they were good enough to promote. It took quite a bit of scrolling because you would be surprised at how many films redbox.com has but eventually I managed to find a movie that I felt an instant connection with and and truth told, if, if you can read, then you probably know what that movie is already from the, from the title. To those of you who can't read, no judgments, but the movie I found was called Courting Mom and Dad. It seemed cheap, it looked shitty, and most importantly, it starred Scott Baio, who you may know as the least interesting character to ever appear on Arrested Development. You need blah, blah, blah. Even better, when I searched it in YouTube, the only videos about it I could find were very poorly viewed trailers and this one video about how they broke union rules in order to make it. In other words, it was absolutely perfect. I found my movie. And now that I've found my movie, all that I need to do is watch it and talk about it and hope that it's bad and fun and who knows, I might even learn a lesson along the way. So I'm going to go watch it now and Fingers crossed, I have thoughts on it. Okay, I have thoughts on it. I was immediately drawn to this movie from the title alone because Courting Mom and Dad is very clearly supposed to be a pun, but but as a pun, it's, well, it's unfortunate to say the least. I looked it up just to make sure that courting means what I think it does, and, and yeah, 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 it does. As such, taken literally, that title is, as the French would say, extremely incesty and well let's just say that the fact that they didn't seem to catch that their title invokes images of people trying to romance their own parents is a pretty good indicator of the level of thought and care that went into the making of this film aside from evoking images of 
with people trying to bang their own dads. The courting part of that title is meant to imply that the people in this movie are taking their parents to a court of law because the basic premise of the movie is that three precocious children hire a divorce lawyer in order to sue their parents and prevent them from getting a divorce. And if that sounds like an insane premise, then I think I might be able to clarify things a little bit by letting you guys know up front that this is in fact a Christian movie. And I will say right up front that I find Christian media absolutely fascinating just for the fact that it's just like, like, I, I don't know. It's just like so Christian, if that makes sense. Actually, I guess since it will probably help inform this video, I should probably give you guys a little bit of my relationship with Christianity up front just so you guys can know what you're dealing with and I guess judge how much of an asshole I am based on that. I myself was raised Catholic, but like, but like it was like a really loose form of Catholic. Like we went to church most Sundays, but it was more of a formality than anything. I don't really know how much anyone in my family actually got out of it, you know? Nowadays, I'd probably say that I consider myself more agnostic, but but that said, the Catholicism did manage to seep in there good enough that there's still a part of me that feels guilty for calling myself agnostic. That said, though, though I'm not an actively practicing Christian, I wouldn't say that I have anything against Christians. Like, I know a lot of Christians, and I can see how their faith plays an important part in their lives, and it works for them, and I respect that, and I think it's great. But that said, the form of Christianity that the people I love practice is, is very different from the kind of Christianity in Courting Mom and Dad, for, for the mere fact that all the Christians in my life can can make it through a conversation without bringing up God in some form. The, the people in this movie cannot do that. And honestly, I think that is why I find Christian media so fascinating, because the idea that God would make people for the express purpose of talking about God all the time is, is like, very funny to me. Like, like I kind of feel like if I were God, I'd be uncomfortable with it. Like... Like, like I, w I would look at evangelical Christians and be like, like, like why are you so obsessed with me? It, it's, it's creepy. Presumably, God made all the beauty and mystery and wonder in the world. And since the purpose of art is to try and capture all that beauty and, and mystery and wonder, the idea that people would show their appreciation for the stuff that God created by making this... But, like, I got to imagine that that would be extremely disappointing to him. Or, or her. But, like, I can't watch this movie without picturing God watching it and being like, Why are you focusing on this bullcrap? Have you not seen what I did with waterfalls? Christianity makes sense to me if you view God as a sort of father figure to humanity. And like, in a normal, healthy parent-child relationship, the parent creates the child and gives them certain tools so that they can go off in the world and make their own path. And like, like you love your parents and you recognize them as an important part of your life, but if you can't make it through a conversation without bringing up your parents, then, then I feel like something is a bit off there. I guess in this metaphor, that would make evangelicals like like the Trump children of the Christian world. Like they're too obsessed with their father in a way that's weird and makes it seem like they don't really have lives or identities of their own. And if we're being honest, they're probably worse people because of it. And this is all a long way of saying that watching this movie is a strange experience because... Everything about it is firmly rooted in the belief that the concept of God is the most important, fascinating, amazing thing in the world. And because that core belief that drives every decision being made is so fundamentally different from my own, watching this movie can sometimes feel like peering into an alternate reality where, where everything is just a little bit off.
And you know, rather than babbling on, why don't I just show you what I mean by breaking the plot down beat by beat. Courting Mom and Dad is told as a story within a story, Rime of the Ancient Mariner style. I'm not entirely sure why I know that reference, but apparently I do. We meet the three protagonists as they're leading a zoo meeting with a bunch of other children who are apparently worried about the future of their parents' marriages, something that the movie seems to think is, is a cute little setup, but, but which I personally think is some of the darkest shit that I've ever seen put to film. Yes, I have a question. How much does it cost? Oh, oh. One at a time, we can't hear you. Got some college money saved up. It's not that simple. Excuse me, we are really Ben Stark. Excuse me, excuse me. Yes, you sir. I don't have any money, but if you make my mom and daddy love each other, I'll give you this. Jesus. No, no pun intended. Like I said, everything in this movie is predicated on points that are very different from my own. And perhaps the biggest example of this is the fact that the movie thinks that divorce is the worst thing that can ever happen ever, which, which is weird to me in a lot of ways. Like I personally am a child of divorce, which actually is a big reason why my family stopped being Catholic. And like divorce isn't fun, but it's usually better than the alternative. And this movie super does not seem to realize that, or maybe it does realize that, but, but if it does, it super doesn't care. This movie takes a very childlike view of relationships. Like if it has a thesis statement, it's something along the lines of mommy and daddy have to love each other because they're mommy and daddy. Maybe they are getting a divorce. Andrew, stop. We don't know that for sure. Let's just have faith and everything will work out. Mommies and daddy should stay together. And like, that's actually a pretty horrible lesson to try and teach the world. It feels very obvious to me that the parents in this movie should get a divorce for reasons that I will point out as I go, but the movie seems to think that any relationship can work if you try hard enough, even if the two people in said relationship seem functionally dead inside, like, like the central couple in this film. And actually, the more I think about it, the more I would say that this movie takes that lesson one step further into awful land because since it's about the kids doing a bunch of stuff to make their parents get back together, it, it kind of implies that if you don't fix your parents' marriage, it's kind of your fault for not doing enough, which, well, well, that's just a horribly cruel lesson to put in a children's movie. At least I think it's a kid's movie. I honestly can't tell because while it's definitely dumb enough to be a kid's movie, I can't imagine a situation in which a parent would be like, like, yeah, this is what my kids need to see right now. Like, you'd think that a children's movie about divorce would be to teach the children about the realities of divorce, but this one does not do that. It just gives kids bad ideas about how to handle a divorce. Like honestly, the only scenario in which I could see a parent wanting to show this to their kids would be if they were going through a divorce that they didn't want. And so they were like, well, like I tried everything. Now you try kids, go win your mom back for me. In any case, that was one of what I imagine will be many tangents, but Let's get back to the movie where the sad divorced kids support group asks the main children to tell their story and they're like, yeah, okay, let's just check to make sure we're alone. Will you tell us your story? Oh yeah, right that's a great idea. idea. Yeah. Okay, but it's a really, really long story. Looks like we have some time. Uncle Paul's still sleeping. And I feel like that little interaction is meant to establish their uncle as this sort of lovable goofball character, which, well, I'll talk about that later because I have a lot of thoughts about the uncle. But more than anything, what I think it establishes is one of the biggest problems I have with this movie, which is that these children have a concerning lack of adult supervision. Like, 
Like, I don't really know much about kids and don't have any in my life currently. But, but even I was anxious on their behalf during a lot of scenes in this movie being like, like, where are your parents? This does not seem safe. So anyway, the unsupervised preteens agree to give out a bunch of intimate details of their lives to a bunch of strangers on the internet. And the movie uses this as a way to set itself up in a way that lets you know right up front that this movie is, is not going to be very good. So, where should we start? Ooh, ooh, remember Dad in that funny row? <laughs> no, we should start when we were behind the bushes. And really? Guys, no. the story is not about all the crazy things we did. But it was really fun stuff. Yeah. Our story is about faith, hope, and love, and how adults need to be reminded what they had and what's still there. Clearly that was the movie's way of being like, this is what's in store for you, audience, and I truly can't imagine anyone seeing that and being like, boy oh boy, can't wait. Also for the record, I have seen all those scenes that they're talking about, and they're somehow even less interesting in practice than the movie makes them seem, so like buckle up. Their story begins at the sort of old-school Italian restaurant that apparently still existed in 1998 where the parents have a nice little meat cute. And by nice of course I mean dull and totally devoid of any charm whatsoever. The dad is a waiter and he just kind of bumps into the mom who's a customer and then they fall in love without talking because that's what this movie thinks that love is. It was just another Friday night until he met her. The movie kind of tries to imply that once he sees her, he only has eyes for her, but it does so just by showing this other customer getting annoyed by the fact that he's being completely ignored by his waiter. For the first time in his life, he was speechless. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. And that's unusual for dad. I think they included that moment because the dad's big problem going forward is that he focuses more on his job than his family and I think that they wanted to show that that wasn't always the case but like I just think it's very funny to express romance by showing a pissed off customer in a pizza restaurant like like, like I feel like there's a reason why that scene was not in Romeo and Juliet. From there, the movie does the very cliche thing of having the guy stumble over his words and say something embarrassing because he's so in love. But despite the fact that that happens in literally every rom-com ever, the, the movie couldn't figure out how to do it right. Like, like, like I honestly didn't even realize that that's what was happening until they flat out said that it was by a voiceover. Hey ladies, welcome to Tony's Villa Vista. My name is Brent and I will be taking care of you. Mom said she had a little crush on dad right away. And then I'll be serving you. <laughs> and was pretty funny too. And like, you can tell a movie is funny when it goes to the effort of telling you itself that it's funny because like, like otherwise how would you know? But it was really fun stuff. Yeah. But anyway, the male waiter makes a move on his female customer, and as is usually the case in that situation, it ends with the woman being swept off her feet. And so we're treated to a nice little scene of them forming their family, which is cute, but, but also I feel like it's the strongest piece of evidence that these people should be getting a divorce immediately. The scenes are happy and all, but between the casting decisions and the implied timeline, there's clearly a lot of extremely dark shit happening underneath the surface that I feel like I need to address. The movie says that they met in 1998, which would mean that the timeline for this montage is at most 21 years long. But that said, the sequence takes us all the way up to this shot of the mom holding an extremely fake baby doll meant to represent the youngest daughter and who during the course of this film is portrayed by this little girl right here. And like again, I don't know a lot of kids and am therefore not very adept at gauging their ages, but if I had to guess, I would say that that tiny little human is somewhere between 0 and 18 years old. So like we can split the difference and call her 9, which would mean that at most 10 years has passed between the end of that montage and the start of this movie. And if that's the case, then I am extremely concerned for the dad. Who, who is apparently named Brent. 
uh, although I have already forgotten that that's what his name is and will be only referring to him as the dad from here on out. But anyway, the dad is played by the same young actor all the way through till the end of the happy family montage, but the second the montage is over, the movie switches the actor to Scott Bayo, meaning that in the few years since his youngest daughter was born, the character aged solidly 40 years. And based on the logic of this movie, the only explanation for why that could happen is extreme stress due to a terrible marriage. Well, it's either that or he hates being a dad because his kids are mild sociopaths, but in either case, he's clearly unhappy and should make a change immediately. From there, we go to the present day, where the children have been left unsupervised long enough that they were able to cook a full lasagna dinner complete with origami swan place settings without either of their parents knowing. And like... I'm going to try and stop nitpicking because I feel like if I don't, we'll be here all day, but I feel like I cannot move forward without pointing out the fact that this movie does not seem to understand how lasagna works. The oldest daughter is scrambling to finish the meal and to show her panic, she does this. What am I forgetting? Oh yeah, sauce. And anyone with a baseline understanding of lasagna, such as myself, would know that sauce is not something you forget about and then add at the end. Like, like adding sauce is pretty much the only thing you have to do while making lasagna. Forgetting about it isn't so much making lasagna as it is like, like toasting dry noodles with cheese on them. Also, not for nothing, but immediately after she remembers to add the sauce, the movie instantly cuts to the dining room where the lasagna is already finished and on the table because, like, I suspect that this movie doesn't really give a shit. The reason that they're making this meal is because since that montage at the beginning, the parents have separated and the kids are doing their best to get them back together in the laziest attempt at a parent trap that I have ever seen in my life. My favorite part is that when the dad comes in, the kids greet him like this. Okay, okay, open the door. Hi, daddy. Hey. What? <laughs> And like, I don't know, there's just something very funny to me about screaming surprise about lasagna. Like, like I feel like if someone did that for me, I'd be confused more than anything. The kid's plan doesn't seem to work though because the dinner is oozing with hostility. Izzy, great job with dinner. Thanks, Dad. Want more? No, I'm full, thanks, sweetheart. When's your first baseball game? Don't know. Thinking about quitting the team. The low point is probably this little moment that happens midway through when the mom notices the play settings that the kids made. That's a pretty rose. Ruby did that. Details, mom. I remember when your father remembered those details. Which, uh, boy, that woman sure seems unhappy. Seems to me like maybe she should make some major changes to her life or something. After the dinner, the parents talk and we get a sense of why their marriage is on the rocks. Like, apart from the fact that they clearly hate each other, the dad seems to be a bit of a workaholic and is prioritizing his job over his family, a fact which we get to see demonstrated in the very next scene. Chelsea called an emergency meeting for tomorrow, and there's a lot riding on this ally deal. You promised the kids that you would take them to the movie tomorrow. I know that. And I'll do my best to get here by noon. Do you even know what your best is? Nice. The dad is supposed to take the kids to see a movie the next day, but his boss has called an emergency meeting, and now he's not sure if he's going to be able to make it. It's a tale as old as time, and when the dad inevitably does end up choosing work over his family, the movie very much seems like it wants us to think he's being a dick, but like... Like, like, is he, though? For one thing, we see the timestamp on the text his wife sends him when it's clear that he's not going to make it. And while I get that a father should be expected to show up for his kids, expecting him to show up at 1 p.m. on a work day to go see a movie seems like a lot to me. Also, we hear the boss talk about what they're working on a little bit in the meeting, and it sounds like they are quite busy. How many times do we have to go over this? It's obvious. 
We've had radio silence from Allied for the past two weeks, which can only mean one thing. Callaway. We're about to lose $13 million in commission. Sorry just isn't good enough. I'm no expert on business, but it seems like losing a $13 million deal is kind of important and would probably require the dad to miss a couple movies with his kids. Like, like the movie treats the idea that anyone choosing their career over anything else is the worst thing that a person can possibly do. And in that way, it kind of reminds me of The Devil Wears Prada a little bit. But, but like only in that way. In all other ways, it's a very different movie. The dad missing the movie is the final straw, though, and the parents decide that it's time to tell their kids that they're getting a divorce. And remember earlier when I called the kids sociopaths? A large part of me thinking that comes from their reaction to the news. Sometimes for parents to... Be better parents. They need to get, get a divorce. Andrew. Isn't that what you're about to say? <sighs> yes. But we want you to know that we are still going to be a family, okay? Yeah, I think we love you very much. And we love you too. But your divorce has a direct impact on our personal and emotional well-being. So we can't allow this to happen. We'll discuss our next course of action and get back to you. Thank you. What she said. Ditto. I think that the movie thinks that they're being cute and precocious, but if I were a parent, I'd be horrified by that. Like, if my kid did that to me, I'd be instantly just like, Welp, guess it's time for therapy. The next course of action that that weirdly business-like child is referring to is going to their uncle and asking for his advice. So they jump on their bikes without telling their parents and go to his house as is common for all properly supervised children. I think it's this one. Yeah. Remember to look for cars. Yeah. Wait, wait up! The uncle is low-key the weirdest character in this movie because he's meant to be both the comic relief and the moral center, which I guess is a balance that I've seen pulled off before, but like, not not here. Here he kind of just seems like a smartish guy who is slowly dying of an undiagnosed concussion. The way that they show off the uncle's goofy side is by having him hurt himself a lot, but I don't think that the movie's insurance would cover too much physical comedy, so a lot of it happens off screen. Like, like, like when the kids get there, he has just fallen and rather than showing him fall, which might be kind of fun, they just have a weird extended shot of the hill he fell on, I guess, to like give us time to fill in the blanks and be like, yeah, that would be a big fall. Oh, hey guys. Whoa, Whoa what, what happened to you? Well, nothing. I was just uh, cutting a tree down the other day and I fell. Down that hill? Yeah, yeah, down that hill. When we finally do see him hurt himself on screen, it's a very simple injury. So to make up for it, the movie has him overreact in a way that makes me think that the people making this movie understand how human bodies work less than they understand lasagna. It's okay, I, I landed on my feet. Ow! It looks like he landed on his face. Ah. Oh. You know, Uncle Paul, maybe you need help around here. No, it's nothing a little ice won't take care of. Maybe you should sit down for a minute. Oh. The movie then hardcore pivots from having you question if the uncle is fit to live alone to having him give what I think the movie thinks is the smartest, deepest, most important speech in the entire film. Like, he's supposed to be a pastor, and so when the kids tell him that their parents are getting a divorce, he pulls out the spools of yarn that every single man keeps in the bed of their pickup truck and goes into a straight-up sermon. I got something for you. Uncle Paul, focus. We need serious help. Oh, patience, child. Okay. Can we pray or something? Isn't that what pastors do? I can pray, you can pray, and your parents can pray. Okay, which one? That one. For you and that for you. And so what we're going to do, take this string... And you're gonna hold it really tight. Hold it tight, hold it tight. And you're gonna pull, and just like that, not very strong, right? And then we go to the purple one. Watch the purple one. 
watch there's a little string right here and you're gonna hold this really tight yep yep really tight so beautiful oh my goodness look and then we're gonna twist it together with this green one and you're gonna hold it tight and look it's a little stronger oh, 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 you can't get it oh oh my goodness that was strong wasn't it but it still comes undone and now let's go to the gold one and when we take three strings we're gonna twist that together and it all of a sudden becomes a lot stronger and i honestly think that this is the moment where i was like oh the people making this live in a completely different world than me because Based on that setup, I was like, oh, this is going to be about the power of family and sticking together, but this is where he actually was going with it. And so that's what happens when you put God in the center of a marriage. It becomes that much stronger. Maybe I'm just a godless heathen, but in a million years, I don't think I would have guessed that he was going to say that all healthy marriages should be a thruple with Jesus. The uncle tells the kids that despite the fact that they've been separated for a full calendar year, what the parents need is just more time to work on their relationship. And so he gives them the name of a lawyer who he says can help stall their divorce trial. And the movie tries to play it like the uncle is being some wise, understanding sage, when in reality, I feel like he too might just be a sociopath. Like... Like right now, he's helping his sister's kids get even more involved in her divorce by introducing them to a strange man who they're going to use to sue her. I, I honestly can't even imagine anything crueler than that. That said, I kind of do like the lawyer though. Like, I'm sure the actor playing him would tell me I'm going to hell if we ever met in real life, but He's having fun with the role, and I respect that. Hi, I'm Donovan Marshall. Call me now, 323-555-0102. There's a new Marshall in town, and he's collecting for you. He's painted as a shyster who just wants media attention, and the way they establish this is by showing him discuss that lovely commercial you just saw, and hearing them talk about it is another one of those times where I'm like, do these people exist in the same world that I do? Oh, ho, ho, ho. you have outdone yourself. Seriously, this is a game changer. I love the line, there's a new marshal in town. Pew, pew, pew. Yeah, yeah. You put it all over social media. We can't afford that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Facebook. Twitter, Instacart. Instagram. He knows what I'm talking about. This movie was literally made in 2020. He, he should know what Instagram is. Or at the very least, the people making this movie should know that there are a lot of ways that you can put stuff on social media that is completely free. The kids meet with the lawyer and at first he turns them away, but then he decides to take on their case both because he owes the uncle a favor and because he thinks that the case could help him drum up publicity for his law practice. It, it takes the movie like 10 scenes to establish all that, but I did it in a sentence because we have to keep moving. On the day of his court case, the dad is doing some research into the ill-defined $13 million business deal that's killing his marriage, and he discovers some potentially shady dealings involving his boss. Oh, no. I have to go, Cal. Listen, I, I hate doing this to you, but there's something not right here. Unfortunately, before he can dig any deeper, he's got to leave for court. And honestly, this is the best evidence the movie gives that the dad might actually be too much of a workaholic. Like, like you'd think he'd take a personal day to rest up before his family was destroyed. Although again, in his defense, his boss doesn't seem to make it easy for him. Are you going somewhere, Lemon? Um, oh yeah, it's, um, it's, it's personal. But I got some good news. I think we may have found something. I believe that the company may be an American tech company. $13 million, Brent. Yes, I know. It's, uh, it's my family. Where are your family, Brent? If the movie has a villain besides the vague concept of divorce, it's probably the guy's boss. And like, I don't know her name because I refuse to learn any of the characters' names in this movie, but if I found out that it was just vaguely ethnic she-beast, I would be like, yeah, that makes sense. After he leaves for his trial, the boss looks at Scott Baio's computer screen and 
sees that he's onto her evil schemes, leading her to try and destroy his career in a manner so cartoonishly villainous that it almost made me wonder if this movie hates women. Uh, honestly, the only reason why I didn't wonder is that the movie immediately cuts to this interaction between Scott Bayo and his lawyer, which kind of just confirmed to me that this movie hates women. Sorry, sorry. Wow. Late for your own divorce hearing. That is one for the books. Oh, it's my boss. She's very manly. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Your boss is a woman? Yeah. Ah, say no more. Is he Again, this movie was released in 2021. The court case begins and the shyster lawyer barges in and somehow manages to insert himself into the case. Your Honor, my name is Donovan Marshall and I represent the children of the litigants. I request permission to be able to represent and sit in on these hearings. The way the movie explains this is basically just that the judge hates the parents' lawyers, which like, seems ethical. Your Honor, it may please you to know that I plan to navigate the litigates out of your courtroom and into family mediation. Mediation? Yes. Do you mean to say if I let you sit in today that you, the three of you will just disappear? Well, that's the plan. Against all logic, though, the shyster's plan works, and so the parents eventually end up in mediation, which... Like, I honestly wasn't expecting anything exciting to happen in this movie, but it still somehow managed to feel anticlimactic. Like, based on the premise, you'd think that there would be some long, three-way courtroom family drama that would make up the bulk of the plot, but this is the only courtroom scene we get until the very end. Like, I honestly kind of get the sense that the reason there's not more of a court case is that whoever is making this seems strangely invested and trying to keep the plot realistic to how it would play out in an actual court of law, which is weird because the premise is already so stupid and outlandish that you think that they might as well just go balls to the wall and make the interesting version of the thing that they had set out to make. Instead, it will periodically sprinkle in little snippets of dialogue that feel like they were given to the screenwriter via a 15-minute phone call from their lawyer friend and whose only purpose seems to be so that the movie can be like, see, we already know what you were going to say. They don't address the problems in any way, but it feels like whoever's making this movie thinks that if they're the ones who bring up why the plot is unrealistic, that that will somehow make it seem more realistic. This is a no-fault state, and children can't legally stop their parents from divorcing. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> Well, you know, I cannot discuss the details of my ongoing case, Savannah. But what I can say is this. The children. The children are my main priority. And that is not to say that this movie has any idea what the hell it is talking about with regards to the law, because I'm pretty sure most of the legal dialogue here was, was written by someone putting a bunch of old law books into an AI and having autocorrect do the rest. Children have no adversary interest in a divorce action. This is an obvious ploy to derail our proceedings. In any case, that's most of the courting part of courting mom and dad, because the stupid plan works and the parents go to mediation, which is led by this crazy hippie lady who kind of just seems to represent how the people making this movie view anyone who didn't vote for Trump. Divorce is such a harsh word. I prefer the term matrimonial restructuring. And as your court-appointed mediator, and in the spirit of harmony, I would like to welcome you both. Oh, would either of you care for some organic, hibiscus-infused moon tea? How much? Oh, a single cup should interface your chakra and body mind allowing you how work. much is this going to cost oh and i only show you that because she's by far the most interesting character in the movie like she plays a very small role in the plot of the film because the dad instantly gives up on mediation and we never hear from her again unfortunately 
After the dad walks out, the shyster lawyer gets a call and tells the kids that their parents rejected mediation, and so there's nothing else he can do, but... Then one scene later, he gets a tongue lashing from his receptionist, and that inspires the lawyer to be less selfish and work harder to see if there's anything he can do, which leads me to my favorite scene in the movie, which is just like this weird training montage, but like instead of anything interesting happening, it's just this guy reading a bunch of books. I timed it out and that goes on for about a minute straight, which might not sound like a lot, but believe me when I tell you that when you're the one who's actually watching it, it, it definitely is. P particularly when you hear what the plan he comes up with is. Isabel, Donovan Marshall here. Mr. Marshall? Listen, tomorrow your parents are going back to court. Mr. Marshall, I get you don't want to help us, but let's not rub salt in the wound. No, 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 no. I want to help. Really? Yeah, I think I found it. Found what? Okay, this is a long shot, but I got one important question for you. Do your parents still love each other? I know they do. Well, then your parents just need to be reminded. Reminded? Isabel, sometimes adults need a little push in the right direction so they can remember why they chose that path in the first place. Like, I don't know what law book he was reading to come up with that idea, but... I feel like it probably should not have taken him all night. The kids take his advice though and they trick their parents into meeting up at the Italian restaurant where they fell in love where they're greeted with a box full of a bunch of old keepsakes from their relationship which causes the two of them to reminisce about their past and it all culminates in this genuinely touching moment. Oh boy. I did this of you right here. You believe in love at first sight. And I said, love at first sight is easy. It's when two people who have been staring at each other for years, that's when it becomes a miracle. Do you remember what you said to me after that? Come on, Brent, do you remember? Look, I'm tired of keeping this thing back and forth. Get out there, nail down this deal with Dolbatek, all right? Well, go on. Brent, do you remember? I'm so sorry. Will you excuse me just for a minute? Oh, wait, I messed that up. Instead, the dad completely ignores the mom again in, in the most callous way imaginable. The dad sees some guy who has something to do with the $13 million deal they've been talking about that I don't really care to explain right now because fuck this movie. And so rather than respond to his wife, he, he decides to instead leave her mid-conversation and go do business. And honestly, I've been mostly on the dad's side for a lot of this video, but right here is where I was like, okay, I get it. Like, he very clearly has not been focused on his relationship, and also, I think he just has terrible time management skills. Like, he very easily could have just answered her question there and been like, excuse me for a second, and everything would have been fine, but instead he fucks off mid-sentence and, like, it's very clearly a slap in the face of his wife and honestly their marriage as a whole. Not surprisingly, when he's done doing the exact thing that was destroying his marriage on a night that he was supposed to be working on his marriage, his wife is gone and the next scene they're back in court to continue with their divorce proceedings. And at this moment there's like 10 minutes left in this movie and watching this you're like, there's no way they can justify the two of them getting back together. And if you say that, then, well, well, you'd be absolutely right. Like, don't get me wrong, they do end up getting back together, but the rationale behind it is, like, absolutely baffling. Basically, the lawyer dude cites some stipulation in the law where you have to provide good evidence that you don't love the spouse that you're divorcing. Well, Your Honor, may I draw the court's attention to California Code 598.5, subsection 1, paragraph G, which states, The trial petitioner must present satisfactory evidence that there has been a breakdown of the marriage relationship and that there remains no reasonable likelihood that the marriage can be preserved which I guess is what he was doing with those law books, although, like, 
Like, I'm not a divorce lawyer in California, but it's, it seems to me that the law he cites would probably have been on the first couple of pages. I feel like he still probably wouldn't need to have been up all night like he was. I, I think he might just not be a very good lawyer. He uses the law as an excuse to call the mom to the stand where he grills her in a manner that's so mean and tone deaf that even the movie itself feels the need to step in and stop it. Was there adultery? No, never. Were either you or Mr. Lambert sentenced to prison? Is there allegations of abuse? What? No, you have it all wrong. Oh, got it all wrong. Well, then enlighten us, Mrs. Lambert. Please explain to us why we're all here today. Uh, I felt so alone. Oh. And you thought by divorcing your husband, that's going to make you feel less alone? No, I just wanted Brent to prioritize our marriage and make me feel important as, as much as the kids and his job. And you thought by nagging him, by blaming him, by withholding your love and support for him. Mr. Marshall, I find your tone unnecessarily hostile. But the mom can't say for sure that she doesn't still love the dad. And then the dad stands up and says he'll pay more attention to her. So like... I don't know, fuck it, I guess they get back together. It's a happy ending, and the problems they have will never be a problem again, despite the fact that they have been problems in literally every other scene in the movie up to this point, because, like, like Jesus or, or some shit? I don't know. It may not seem like it, but that was actually a fairly light overview of the plot. Like, I left out a lot of scenes, most of which were just weird conversations between the uncle and other characters where he gives bad advice that the movie thinks is really good. Um, there's also a weird subplot involving the dad going to a barbecue restaurant naked under a pink robe that I'm pretty sure qualifies as a sex crime, but I'm honestly kind of sick of trying to make this plot sound interesting, so instead I think we should just move on, okay? Yes, very much so. Kinda? Like, when I first saw the movie's title, there was part of me that secretly hoped that I might have stumbled on my own version of The Room or Fateful Findings, and this movie is definitely not that. Like, truth told, if I hadn't committed myself to talking about this movie before I watched it, I probably would have not done a video on it after I had watched it and would have instead maybe looked for something a little more interesting to talk about. But that said, since I was already committed, it kind of forced me to take a good honest look at the movie in a way that I probably wouldn't have otherwise. And the more I did that, the crazier and crazier it all started to feel. When I started, I was genuinely worried that I wasn't going to have enough to say, but as it turned out, the hardest part of writing this script was that there were too many weird details that I wanted to include, and I wasn't sure what to leave out. Like, you may notice that the plot summary kept getting broader and broader the longer I went on, and that's because I had to keep telling myself to move on in order to keep this video at under four hours. And like, I didn't even touch on some of the weirder things, you know, like, this weird Christian witch ritual that the kids do towards the end of the movie that, like, genuinely kind of creeps me out a little bit. That was Mom. She didn't sound very happy. What are we gonna do? We can't let them go to court tomorrow. We could try movies. Got a fever. That always works. Tricks aren't gonna work this time, guys. It's up to them. One, can be overpowered. Two, can defend themselves. But a court of three is not easily broken. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And even if this movie isn't The Room, I do still think that there's a lot of fun to be had there, you know? Even if you're not looking at it in a scholarly context like I did. It's not as crazy as the best bad movies I've ever seen, and I certainly wouldn't call it some great undiscovered gem, but you can certainly pop it on the TV with a beer in your hand and spend the next like hour and a half yelling at your TV screen, which honestly is all you really want in a bad movie anyway. That said, I don't know if I can properly recommend you watch this movie because certain moments put just a bad enough taste in my mouth that I don't know if you want to give the people who made it any money. 
you know, like I did when I purchased the movie to make this video. And we'll probably continue to do when the people who made the movie give me like a copyright claim. Shit. Honestly, maybe. If there's a salient point in being made by this movie, it seems to be that sometimes you have to try in order to make things work. And while I don't necessarily agree with it in the context of this movie, I think I agree with it in literally every other aspect of life. I mentioned a lot that watching this movie felt like peering into a completely different world. And the thing that I kept thinking about is an article that I read the headline of a while ago about an experiment where some dude read a bunch of left-leaning articles on one Facebook account and then a bunch of right-leaning articles on another Facebook account and then he just let the algorithm do the rest. And the end result of that experiment was two completely different timelines with completely different news stories from what looked like two completely different worlds. And honestly, watching this movie, I very much felt like I was watching a movie with a very, very different timeline from my own. Metaphorically speaking, of course, I don't really use Facebook anymore. Also, the movie isn't a cognitive being, so it probably doesn't use social media either. Algorithms and AIs and all those other technological advancements that I'm not even going to pretend like I understand all seem to exist for the sole purpose of giving us more of what we want when we want it. And as they get better and better, we're just going to see less and less of the stuff that we don't want. And I know this is not a new thought, like if you've read a think piece since Obama left office, then you already know what I'm talking about. But it's impossible not to think about it when you watch this movie. The mere fact that this movie exists is a stark reminder that we all live in our own little bubbles. And as things get more and more targeted to our own specific interests and ideas of what's good, those bubbles are only going to get smaller and more specific. I talked at the beginning of this video about how weird it is to me that evangelicals can be so single-minded in their interest in God, but by the same token, I get where that comes from. God is just what works for them and what makes them happy, and so they've learned to seek it out and focus on it, and there's a lot of stuff tailor-made for them to indulge in this one thing that makes them happy, so they keep indulging in it until their life is kind of singular in its focus. And when you think about it that way, watching this movie is less like looking into a different world and more like looking into a potential future because while I don't think that I have interests that are as easily catered to as the people making and watching this movie, I feel like if the technology gets good enough, I could probably get there one day. And if that's the case, then it's kind of terrifying because honestly, all I could think watching this movie is, God, do these people's lives seem so boring. The more I think about algorithms and technology giving us more of what we want, I can't help but think about my initial attempts to look for a bad movie on Amazon and just how hard it was to find anything terrible. I had to really work hard to scrape the bottom of the barrel and even then I couldn't really do it. Everything these days seems to be focused on getting us to the best thing, but truth be told, the best thing isn't always the best. The whole reason I started this journey was to find a terrible movie because there's something kind of magical about things that are so singularly imperfect that they swing back around to being awesome again. It's the sort of thing you can't really fake or force or plan for. No matter how hard you try or how advanced things get, you'll, you'll never be able to produce that sort of thing on purpose because doing it on purpose kind of defeats the purpose. There's honestly nothing worse to me than movies that are bad on purpose. I think the sort of movie I'm looking for kind of has to just happen and it feels to me like it's happening less and less. Most of the bad movies I hear about now aren't so much bad as they are boring. The biggest complaint I hear about the worst movies coming out nowadays are that they are all the same. There's nothing exciting or new about them, they're just tired rehashes of things that someone else already did in the past that worked. And it's not just movies. As everything in our lives becomes more and more streamlined, I feel like we kind of run the risk of losing some of the interesting quirks of the world. For as much as I may have ragged on them over the course of this video, we're 
Honestly, none of us all that different from evangelical Christians. As we become more and more targeted with easy answers and stuff we love and things we want to see and hear, I honestly worry we might all one day end up in the same weird, sterile, mind-numbingly dull world that the people in this movie seem to live in. And I don't think I'm saying anything particularly new or, or interesting. But more than anything, making this video was a nice little reminder that it's important to fight against the current a little bit every now and then and do your best to peek your head out of your bubble whenever you can. I honestly think it's great that technology is making a lot of things a lot better, but I also think that there's still a lot of value in stuff that's not always perfect all the time. And as things progress towards only giving us the good stuff, I think it's important to do your best to try and find the weird, wonderful imperfections of the world that make it a more interesting place. Because honestly, if you don't try, I worry that you're going to see those things less and less. I don't think that courting mom and dad is exactly what I wanted it to be, but I'm happy that I watched it and I'm going to keep searching for a movie that is because that's the only way I'm ever going to find one. If you maybe have a movie that you think might fit the bill and hasn't been talked about a lot, then please post it below and maybe I'll check it out and make a video about that because why not? And if you don't, then I'll just keep searching on my own because I really want to find my own bad movie and if I ever want to find one, I'm gonna have to keep trying. Also, I know I just complained about algorithms a lot, but that said, please like and comment and subscribe and turn on notifications and stuff to help my standing in the YouTube algorithm because no matter what I said up until this point, the YouTube algorithm is still absolutely perfect, provided that it starts to promote my videos. If not, it can burn in hell too. But whatever you do, just like and subscribe. And I don't know. This video kind of took a weird turn, didn't it?